I want to welcome everybody. I'm Magda Terer. I'm the Literature and Judaic Studies at Fordham, and I'm a co-director of the Center for Jewish Studies uh, here. Uh, and I am really delighted to see so many of you here in person, and um, as just as many or more online. So welcome to audiences from uh, wherever you are joining us online, and our uh, local students and faculty and, and uh, fellows um, and friends of the center here at the Walsh Family Library and the Special Collections and Archives. Um, I want to um, welcome you to this event, and this is one of those wonderful uh, events that we've been uh, delighted to have over the years our close friendship and collaboration with the Center for Medieval Studies at Fordham has yielded a lot of programs um, and bringing uh, Jewish studies um, into traditional medieval studies in conversation, enriching our, uh, both our centers and our scholarship. Uh, over the years, we've hosted a number of programs in art, in art history, in history, um, uh, scholars from uh, from Israel. Especially, we have um, we have collaboration with Ben Gurion University. So uh, some of the uh, scholars from Ben Gurion were here. And today, we are really delighted to welcome uh, Professor Alicia Baumgarten from Hebrew University, with whom we also have collaborative ag agreement for. Uh, especially study abroad program when it finally re reopens and functions again. And uh, uh, this is not the first time Professor Baumgarten is here at Fordham, and we hope to welcome her many, many more times. Before I turn over um, the podium to my colleague, uh, Nick Paul from the Medieval Studies to uh, introduce our speaker, I just want to uh, thank my co-director, Sarit Katan Gribet, uh, for all her work on behalf of the center, to uh, Shavan Verletza for, uh, we have here food, uh, as we do in in uh, in-person events, so for making sure the food is here, delicious food is here, and also for the all the logistics that are uh, there. And finally, I want to uh, thank the Fordham University Libraries for being such an amazingly welcoming place for us, for the center, um, both in terms of uh, a, uh, helping us build and, and our Judaica collection which uh, also has almost all of the Hebrew facsimiles that there are that, uh, uh, that have been published over, over the, well, I guess not almost a century now, because I think the earliest facsimiles came in the 1920s. So uh, we're, we're still acquiring them. So medievalists uh, can have access to these amazing Jewish uh, manuscripts. Um, and we hope to do some more pro programming around them in the future. So without further ado, um, Nick, the floor is yours to introduce our distinguished speaker. Thank you so much, Magda. Um, uh, so I, I would, I'm echoing uh, some of uh, Magda's comments, but just to say, you know, especially recently, the field of medieval studies uh, is in theory, is in ideally intended to encompass the full range of the human experience in the pre-modern world across the medieval uh, millennium. But in practice, in the American Academy, the realization of such a total view of uh, uh, people and their lives proves very challenging, uh, uh, both because of the longstanding emphasis uh, within medieval studies on the lives of Latin Christians, um, uh, also the traditional emphasis on Western Europe and the bias of our historical sources toward uh, the stories of and concerns of elites. Um, and those of you who have seen me speak at Jewish studies events in the past have heard me say uh, many times, and I'll keep saying it, how much the study of the pre-modern past at Fordham has been enriched in recent years by the Center for Jewish Studies uh, under the dynamic leadership of Magda Tater and Sarid Katan Gribitz. Um, uh, and this afternoon's event is a perfect example. I'm delighted to welcome uh, uh, today's uh, uh, guest, uh, an esteemed colleague and renowned uh, medieval historian, Professor Elisheva Baumgarten. Uh, 
Yitzhak Becker, Becker Chair of Jewish Studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Professor Baumgarten is the author of three monographs, of Mothers and Children, Jewish Family Life in Medieval Europe, published by Princeton in 2004, Practicing Piety in Medieval Ashkenaz, Men, Women, and Everyday Religious Observance, published by the University of Pennsylvania in 2014, and Biblical Women and Jewish Daily Life in the Middle Ages, also published by the University of Pennsylvania in 2022. Um, she's also the author of a great number of articles, of book chapters, uh, and editor of collections, um, the list of all of which would take up our whole time today to relate to you. Um, and the excellence of this scholarship uh, has been recognized by numerous awards and fellowship, including the Cat Center at UPenn, uh, the IAS at Princeton, the IAS Jerusalem. Um, and uh, it's the mark of a truly dynamic scholar, a truly, truly dynamic scholar, that one's information about them goes out of date very, very quickly. So I was here to prepare to tell you all about the exciting project that she was leading, um, uh, only to find that, in fact, that project is over. And there is a new project that has superseded it, um, entitled Contesting with Crises. Uh, uh, and I think a part of that is what we are going to be hearing about in our presentation today. Uh, this is really pathbreaking research uh, to shed light on the lives of those so often absent from our historical sources and our scholarship. Uh, and we are greatly, deep, uh, deeply grateful again, uh, again to Jewish Studies for bringing Professor Baumgarten to Fordham for her talk today, which is entitled uh, Contesting with Dom Domestic Crisis, Jewish Marriages in the Late Middle Ages. Please join me in welcoming Professor Baumgarten. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Nick. And uh, I want to begin by thanking my host today, Professor Magda Tedder and Professor Sarit Katan Ribbitz, who are the co-directors here. Um, the co-directors here at the Fordham Center of Jewish Studies. I have been following and also have had the privilege of participating in different events here at the center over the past years. And I want to say that I'm simply in awe of what the two of you have done here. Over the, I couldn't tell exactly for how long, but certainly the past decade, uh, you've built a tremendous center for Jewish studies and one that people from all over the world uh, look forward to taking part in an event. So thank you very much for having me here. A special thanks for this invitation last spring and for your patience uh, as I figured out the details in light of the war uh, that took all of us by surprise this past fall. Um, I had hoped to come when the war was behind us. And when I said yes to Magda in late December, and I said, yes, I'll come to New York, I couldn't even imagine that the war would still be going on and we'd be at day 146 of this terrible war. So as things stand now, uh, let me just express the deep hope that I'm sure that you all share with me that the situation in the Middle East improves rapidly, that all the hostages return home safely, and that a sustainable peace will be found for Israel, for the Palestinians, and for the entire region as soon as possible. So now that I've said a word about current events, let me go back to the past. So my starting point for today's talk is far from the medieval period that will be my focus. I am certain many of you are familiar with the famous novel, Hevia the Milkman, written by Solomon Naumovich Rabinovich, better known as Shalom Alechem, that became the world-known musical Fiddler on the Roof. At the heart of this story is a societal change that leads to multiple domestic crises throughout the story. Tevya, the poor milkman, the protagonist, has numerous daughters who refuse to follow what is presented as tradition. They refuse to marry whoever Papa picks. Of course, it is not just the girls who are refusing to follow paternal choices. It is also the sons. It is this process that of making a match and choosing a spouse, and the crises connected to this process that will be at the center of my talk today. However, we will not be focused on the pale of the settlement in the late 19th century. Rather, I will be looking at you at the way marriages, specifically first marriages, were made in medieval Europe. The sources I present to you today will be for the most part legal sources, halachic sources, written in Hebrew throughout the area, usually known as Ashkenaz, worldly defined by joint custom. And together today, we will look at sources written in England, Northern France and Germany, from Lincoln, 
which I circled here, to Regensburg in the east of Germany. Scholars studying the Jews of medieval Ashkenaz have agreed quite emphatically with Shalom Aleichem, namely that until modern times, if you wish, from the Mishnah, from late antiquity to modernity, Jews or Jewish fathers chose their children's partners, leaving them with little choice but to marry whoever was chosen. Jacob Katz's work is a prime example of this argument. In his 1958 book, Tradition and Crisis, this was part of the crisis he was describing, children who began to protest their parents' choices. In my talk today, I will argue that this was not so, and that this process was not as smooth or as straightforward as had been presented. Katz and other based their conclusions primarily on legal sources, sources written in Hebrew by medieval Jews that pertain to halakha, to Jewish law, and were written with the purpose of interpreting or determining the law, whether for a specific case at hand or in a general, more prescriptive way. My talk today is part of a research project that I have returned to after a number of detours over the past years, an attempt to write a social history of Jewish marriage in medieval Ashkenaz. And when I say social history, it's in contrast to a legal history. And I'll be trying to argue that what's been written to date is mainly a legal history. Writing a social history of marriage is not an easy task, as we do not have a variety of sources for the medieval period that could help outline social dynamics. We don't have lists of different local communities, marriage records, or vignettes of daily life. Indeed, the most prevalent sources we have are legal sources. The legal sources in Latin and the vernacular often define the rights of Jews to live in specific locations or tax records or economic obligations. And these are important for understanding marriage because they outline where Jews could live. The Hebrew sources are more varied. Some are commentaries on Jewish texts, such as the Talmud. Others are prescriptive books, such as custom books. In addition, there are contracts, as well as legal responsa, which questions written to rabbis concerning events that occurred and went wrong, requesting the rabbi to whom the letter was penned to find a solution. These sources contain a lot of information about society, as we will see throughout my talk. At the same time, they represent exceptions rather than the rule. They are about places where marriage went wrong, where bad things happened, where they are prescriptions of what people should be doing. They don't tell us what people were actually doing. Moreover, only if you had enough money could you write a letter to a rabbi and maybe have enough time to receive a response. Most people didn't have the time or the means to ask these questions. So Nick introduced me by saying that I usually like to focus on what is beyond the elite. Today, I'm going to be giving a rather elitist talk because everyone only says to me, what about the legal sources? So I decided to take the opportunity of this invitation to actually tackle that question. And only at the end of my talk will I come back to perhaps those people who were within the elite. But in what follows, I will focus on these legal sources regarding the ways children were expected to consent to the marriages their parents, and specifically their fathers arranged for them. And I will argue against what I called the fiddler on the roof picture just a moment ago. I will contend that the legal sources, like sources from any genre, need to be read more critically than they've been read to date and that fewer generalizations can or should be drawn from them. At the same time, I hope you will also agree at the end of my talk that these are incredibly rich sources and cannot be ignored. So underlining my talk is the need to balance between the importance of this literature and the need to consider it in a way that recognizes its limitations. Legal literature deals with many issues in the context of marriage, from the rules governing conjugal property to the proper way to create a marriage or to disassemble it. Today, I will focus on one aspect of marriage, consent, who needed to agree to the marriage. Consent was, as we will see in just a moment, a basic principle in all discussions of Jewish marriage from late antiquity. Yet consent, as we know too well today, is not a straightforward concept. Who has to agree? The couple being wed, their families, their parents, a religious authority, how was consent defined? We all know this isn't simple now and wasn't simple in the past. In the medieval context, this question was particularly loaded. During the high Middle Ages, a number of crucial 
changes took place regarding the institution of marriage. First and foremost, the definition of the Christian marriage as a sacrament, a process that is actually dated to the 13th century, which is where many of my sources today will come from. An important aspect of the sacramentalization of Christian marriage, or some would say perhaps the most important aspect of Christian marriage becoming a sacrament was related to consent. Who needed to consent to a marriage? How one consented to it, whether it was the couple themselves, their families, their parents, religious leaders, all of these were part of the medieval Christian debate. It became widely accepted from the 13th century and onwards that it was enough for the people committing themselves to marriage to consent in present tense for the marriage to be binding, often much the frustration of parents and other family members. Though this topic was debated and amended, this principle prevailed and came to be a guiding principle. And we all know this from movies when you say, I do. There has been a lot of research about medieval Christian marriage and specifically about this concept of consent. But we are going to dive into the Hebrew sources and then come back to the Christians at the end of my talk. So how did medieval Jews respond to this change? Abraham Grossman, one of the most important scholars who have studied medieval Jewish marriage stated, during the 12th century and thereafter in Christian Europe, there was a firm widespread opinion in support of marriage requiring the full agreement of both parties. This is what he says about the Christians. But this in fact, not leave much of a mark on Jewish society. Only a small number of Jewish sages recognized the right of young sons and daughters to choose the partners they willed. They accepted Norman Jewish society in both Muslim countries and in Christian Europe for the parents to choose the partner for their children. Grossman echoes what Irving Agus wrote in 1969. In the period under study, it was customary for Jews to marry off their daughters and sons even before they reached the age of puberty. A girl would become betrothed at the age of seven, eight, or nine, and would actually be married at 11 or 12, while her male partner would be almost the same age. Of course, consent and age are inherently linked. For the older and more independent the person getting married is, the more independence one could expect from their choices. So this ends my introduction. Now you know the background, what people have said, and it's time for us to move on. We are oriented to place Ashkenaz, the Jews of Northern France, Germany, and England. I will be talking about the time, the 12th to the 15th century. We are aware of a big change going on in the world around the Jews, when marriage becomes a Christian sacrament. And we know what most scholars have said, and for shorthand, I can already call it the fiddler of the roof rule of thought. So what do I want to do with you today? What follows will be split into four sections. First of all, I will present the Talmudic commentary, the most basic source that has been at the foundation of all the research to date. Then I will look at contracts drawn up before marriages and ask about the stakes at hand if someone didn't follow through with the match set up by their parents. The third section of my talk will discuss how consent to marriage was understood and how these understandings changed in the Middle Ages, especially in the late 13th century and afterwards looking at the sponsor. Throughout these sections of my talk, I will be arguing that these legal sources need to be read, read differently than they have been read to date. Finally, we will look very briefly at non-legal sources to see how they alter the picture. So the primary source quoted by scholars to present a typical medieval marriage is a Tosafist commentary on Tractate Kiddushin. The Tosafist lived in Northern France and wrote during the 12th and 13th century. In order to understand what the Tosafist I am interested in said, please bear with me as I first present the Mishnah and then the Talmud, because the Tosafist, of course, were commenting on both these texts. The Mishnah says, a man can betroth a woman by himself or by means of his agents. Similarly, a woman can become betrothed by herself or by means of her agent. A man can betroth his daughter to a man when she is a young woman, a na'ava, either by himself or by means of his agent. Let's notice that there are three options here. A man betrothing a woman, a woman betrothing herself, and finally, a father betrothing his daughter. 
I would suggest that in medieval practice, all of these options took place. So the option of a father betrothing his daughter is only one of these options. But we will focus on the father betrothing his daughter for our purposes. The Mishnah states that the daughter is a na'ara, meaning a young woman. This is a legal category. There are three legal categories used within the halachic text. Kitana, a small girl, is a minor under age 12. Na'ara is a young woman until roughly 12 and a half. It's also defined by physical attributes, physical maturity. And the gedola is a woman of majority age from 12 and a half. So the Talmud comments on this and says, when she is a young woman, yes, he can betroth her. When she is a minor, no, he cannot betroth her. Now, I know that the age 12 and a half sounds terrible to us today as modern people, but there's a big difference between below 12 and 12 and a half when a girl is already physically mature. And the Talmud continues. This statement supports the opinion of Rav. As Rav Yehuda says, that Rav says, and some said it was said by Rabbi Eliezer, and all of you who have studied Talmud with Sarit know that this is how the Talmud goes. It is prohibited for a person to betroth his daughter to a man when she is a minor until such a time that she grows up and says, I want to marry so-and-so. So here we have our consent. The girl has to agree as a person of major legal status to the marriage. The Tosafist commentary written in medieval France explains why the Talmud says this and explains, a man should not betroth his daughter when she is a minor. And even though above, further above in the Talmud it is stated, it is better to be married that is said about a woman who reached the age of majority and consents to marriage because we are not concerned she will change her mind. But a minor who is betrothed by her father would need to be concerned that if she was majority age, she would not have agreed to the match. So the Talmud thus far seems to be agreeing, I'm sorry, the Tosafist thus far seems to be agreeing with the Talmud. But here comes a statement that I want us to learn together. So we have finally come to the statement I want us to learn together. And this is the comment that became most influential. It is repeated in every book of research, it is repeated by early modern commentators, etc. And the Tosafist says as follows. And now we, Anu, are accustomed to betrothing our daughters, even minors, a filu ktanot, even when they are a ktana, because every day the exile becomes harsher. That if a person is able to provide his daughter with a dowry, perhaps at some later time, he will not be able to do so, and his daughter will remain chained and aguna forever. This comment suggests that families or fathers choose partners for their daughters when they are minors because of the difficulty of paying for dowries. It also suggests that men would marry their children, the Kadesh, and I'll get to that word in a minute, and pay the dowry at once so as not to miss the opportunity for a match. But if we pay close attention to what is being said here, it seems that the Tosafist is not saying this is what we do all the time. He's saying a change is going on around us. The Tosafot for Kiddushin, and we can see this here, he says, because every day the exile becomes harsher. The Tosafot for Kiddushin were written by two specific rabbis. We know their names, Rabbi Isaac and Rabbi Moshe of Evru. It was a place in northern France, pretty close to Paris. As the Friar and the Melech Urbach already noted, this statement, because every day the exile is becoming harsher, is actually quite accurate. These two men lived in the late 13th century. This was a period of increased hardship for the Jews of northern France, who were subsequently expelled in 1306 and finally in 1394. In general, the 14th century was a period of tremendous hardship were medieval Jews in Ashkenaz, and I just wrote down some of the very harsh events they experienced during the 14th century. Maybe during the Q&A, I can talk a little bit about my new research project, which is called Contending with Crises, as was mentioned, and it's about Jewish life during this period. And of course, looking at how marriage changed during a period of crisis is very, very interesting. And that's how my personal project fits into my group's bigger project. So our first idea I wanna to propose to you is that this source has been generalized in most research. We saw the two people before who said that throughout the Middle Ages, Jews married their children off at a very early age. 
They were basing it on this source. But this source is actually a very specific moment in time, the late 13th century. And it suggests that this idea or this practice of marrying young girls without their consent is new. Indeed, if you look at a number of other legal sources from the time, they all say you should not marry minor girls. Girls shall only be married when they reach majority age. And if you look at the way this Tosafot was copied, which I've done over the past few days, but it didn't make it into the talk, many Tosafot skip this part of the commentary, clearly because they don't feel comfortable with it and they don't want to be copying it. But this is what has made it into the books that we read as history. Now, reading this Tosafot commentary raises other questions as well. It states, and now we, Anu, are accustomed to betrothing our daughters, Le Kadesh, even as minors. The language here requires clarification. Jewish marriage had a number of stages. Shiduchin, the making of the match. Erusin, betrothal. Kiduchin, betrothal. And Nisuin, marriage. You might be a little bit confused. Erusin and Kiddushin are basically translated into English as betrothal. In late antiquity, Erusin and Kiddushin were, synony were synonyms for betrothal, and they took place a full year often before the Nisuin. The betrothal stage was binding, and it required a divorce, even if the stage of Nisuin was never reached. In medieval Ashkenaz, like today, it became more and more common to perform Kiddushin and Nisuin together. So by the late 13th century, when this source was written, this was the accepted procedure. So what does the commentary mean when it says, and now we are accustomed to betrothing our daughters, le Kadesh, Kiddushin, because every day the exile becomes harsher. Are they suggesting separating the Kiddushin and the Nisuin? <clears throat> How do they use this verb, le Kadesh? Splitting the parts of the ceremony is not evidence in medieval sources before or after the 13th century. Most ritual custom books have the two parts of the ritual performed together. <clears throat> what do they mean? I don't have an answer. I'm raising a question. In addition, an aguna is a woman whose husband has abandoned her. But a woman who doesn't marry is not an aguna. So why are they saying that if the girl doesn't get married, she will be an aguna? So we have a lot of questions that come up from this commentary. And the final question is, what does anu mean? Who are we? Grossman suggested that Anu was the rabbis, and the rabbis decided to do this to their daughters, and others followed suit afterwards, and it became common practice. Of course, Grossman is reading this as a general medieval statement and not at a late 13th century point in time. So to sum up my argument thus far, I am suggesting to you that this is a very specific point in time, and that this idea is not exactly clear what they're talking about, but if it exists, it's a new trend and didn't exist before. Now we can move to part two. What is the system? What's going on? How are marriages made? I would argue that it was common for parents to propose a marriage for their children when they were young. This does not mean they were subsequently married. The Shiduchin took place at an early age. Both before and after the late 13th century, there are many sources that tell of Reuben agreed with Shimon that Reuben's daughter would marry Shimon's son. And here we encounter another widespread assertion in scholarly literature, the idea that once such agreement was made, families feared breaking the agreement. As a result, they would marry their children and they would prefer that their children would subsequently get divorced rather than break the deal they had made together. So let's go back to the research again so you'll believe me. Grossman suggests that this explains the very high number of divorces in medieval Ashkenaz. And he says here, um, that there was an early marriage and lack of consideration by the parents of the children's wishes and feelings in choosing their intended partner. And once the children matured, their wishes and feelings often changed. <laughs> the partners chosen for them in their youth were no longer suitable to them. And thus, they got divorced. This is based on the idea that a cherem, a decree of excommunication, was imposed on anyone who broke a marriage agreement. And that such a cherem was a severe threat. It was avoided at all costs. So what I want to do with you now is look at a few contracts that mention this cherem, and together we can try to figure out what this means. Cherem is usually con um, translated as excommunication, which means you can't belong to the community, nobody will recognize you, they won't let you come to synagogue, they won't let you be part of any social event or anything going on. 
So what you see here is an agreement between Rabbi Yom Tov, son of Moses, the father of the bride, and Rabbi Solomon, the son of Eliab, the bridegroom from Norwich in 1245. The father promises his daughter, Tiona, to Solomon. Yom Tov promises to not only give his daughter to the groom, but also to give Solomon a generous sum during the year after their marriage that included money, a place to live, clothing. He promises to pay their taxes and to hire a teacher for the groom. When I practiced this talk on my students last week, I read the contract out to them. They said it was much too long. You're hearing me summarize it. You'll have to believe me that this all exists in the contract, okay? If the wedding were to be delayed, or it was set for a few months later after this uh, contract was signed, then they could push it off a little bit longer, but at a certain point, that was enough. And if either side did not uphold this contract, they would enter into the state of cherem, which we usually translate as execution. So Rabbi Yom Tov promised to compel his daughter Tiona to enter the marriage canopy and to pay the money's promise. And Solomon promised to enter the marriage canopy. And if, heaven forbid, one of them refuses to fulfill the said conditions, the one who refuses will be forbidden by the ban of the communities, while the other will be released and permitted. Each side deposited five silver marks that would go to the other if they broke the contract. This contract was called by scholars an erusin contract, a betrothal contract. And this is what it was called from the 19th century onward in the literature people were familiar with it for a very long time. However, Judith Alshavi Schlanger, who recently published all these documents, has amended this, and she called it more precisely a shiduchin contract. This is a matchmaking contract. But this couple is not married. They don't have to get a divorce if they don't go through to the marriage. Moreover, it's very clear from this contract that each party has a way out, despite all the limitations. So the couple here is young, but how young are they? Solomon is still learning, and that's why Rabbi Yom Tov promises to pay for his schooling. Is Siona a minor? It's not clear. And what is the meaning of this cherem, that they won't be released? Let's answer this question by looking at another example. All right, I went the wrong way. Am I going the wrong way? Okay, here we go. In the second betrothal agreement from 1271, Benjamin, the father of Aaron, agreed with Belaset, the mother of Judith, regarding the marriage of their children, Aaron and Judith. Here, too, a detailed list of conditions that we forth, with the mother of the bride giving the father of the groom a sum of money and a beautiful Bible what, at, on the day the contract is signed. And the father of the groom promising to provide for the couple. After, um, after their marriage and also pledging some of his valuables in the meantime. What's happening here is a credit loan with the promise of a future marriage. And the monetary collateral and the children are both serving as a promise to this loan. The contract devotes about half the space to what happens if the match doesn't take place, which shows you that there's much more of a fear that the match won't take place than that it will. And it states as follows. If God forbid the arrangement of marriage does not work and Aaron does not marry Judith, Rabbi Benjamin has to return to Mistress Belasse, the book she handed over to him, or he will pay her six marks for the book and the book will be his. And he will also reimburse her for the 20 marks that she handed over to him on the day the contract was signed. And Benjamin will be trusted in his oath concerning what he earned from the coins from the time he received them until the time he returns them. And all the earnings that he earned from the time he received them until he returned them, he will give half to Mistress Belathe and he will retain half for himself. The source then tells us about a communication or about cherem. And in order to fulfill these conditions, Rabbi Benjamin entered the matter of excommunication and also swore an object oath of the Torah, on the Torah, I'm sorry, to fulfill them. Belasse is described as doing the same thing. After detailing all this, the focus of the contract moves to the bride and groom and states that if Aaron refuses to come to the canopy or if his father refuses to comply with all that was agreed, Mistress Belasse will receive the money. And if Judith refuses to come to the wedding, Aaron and Benjamin will receive all the money. What am I trying to tell you? They agreed upon this marriage. They were minors, but they knew there was a good chance it wouldn't happen. This is a credit deal. A family with a lot of money made a deal like this. The cherem is not related to not getting married. 
It related to not paying the fines. Let me show you two more examples very quickly. These examples are from Germany, and then I'll summarize. Both of them are from the late 13th century. They were sent to Rabbi Mayer of Rothenburg, a very well-known rabbi. Concerning Simon, who had a minor daughter, and Reuben, who had a minor son. And Simon committed to Reuben that when your son will be of age, if I do not accept his kiddushin, or my daughter herself, that she is old enough to accept her kiddushin, then I owe you 20 skukim. And Simon died before Reuben's son was 13 years old, and she matured and married someone else, and now Reuben is suing for the money owed to him. The question in this case is not the marriage, it's the money. This is also an interesting case because it shows that the girl could have been married as a minor, but she matured, married who she wanted to marry, and then the parents, or actually uh, the one person who's left, Reuben, is left running after old debt. Rabbi Meir replies that there's no need to pay the debt. He doesn't mention anything concerning the marriage. In another case, Rabbi Meir answers a different question. You asked about Reuben, and Afian's daughter was Simon's son, and they made the financial agreement as they did, and there was no fee between them. So they didn't put down any money at that time. After some time, a rumor spread about the man, a persistent rumor, and the woman heard of this, and she refused to marry him. And now the man has sued her father and mother, the fee of the harem, the communities, a gold ounce. And Reuben said it was not heard of in our realm to have a charge of the harem of communities. And in all of Ashkenaz, this is not the custom. And even in France, where this custom originates, I believe that it is also not customary. This is really interesting that a place where a custom comes from, it's not customary, but we won't go into that. What I want to argue to you here is that what matters here is the money, not the match. They know the match could not work. I'll just end this by saying that traditionally scholars of medieval Ashkenaz have taken cherem or excommunication very seriously, suggesting that it was a severe measure taken within community. But recently my student, Dr. Mary Fenton, so I'm very proud of her, has argued that excommunication was a threat, but was rarely used in medieval Ashkenaz. And Ephraim Kammerfogel has put forward the idea that fines, not excommunication, were how people got, how people got things done in medieval Ashkenaz. So this kind of takes the wind out of the idea that if you didn't marry, you would be excommunicated. But we are left with the idea that children, especially girls, are being married as minor. We just saw that in our last source. So in part three, I would like to discuss that. We just saw that Simon said that if she is old enough to accept her own kiddushin, she can, and she also can be married as a minor. So what was going on here? If a girl was married as a minor, she was not of legal age to make a commitment. As a result, according to Halakha, her father had to accept the kiddushin for her. In other words, she couldn't consent. Remember, that's where we started. She couldn't consent. I think marriages like that were outliers. Now, why do I think that? I have examined dozen of dozens of custom books, and I would say over a hundred ritual prayer books with instructions of how to conduct a marriage. I have found just one book that has instructions on what to do if a minor is getting married. You can see it here, it's there on the side. And here we have an enlargement of that comment. And it says, if she is a minor, you should say these words um, to her father or her brother, you are hereby betrothed to me. So that upholds the idea that a minor cannot consent to marriage. This manuscript is from 1203. So the early 13th century, before our change happened, if it happened at the end of the 13th century, as I suggested. In late 13th century sources, like we've already seen in the responsa, and especially in 14th and 15th century sources, there are more and more records of minors getting married. And we hear questions about how to do this. So for example, in a book of customs that was written by the student of a man called Rabbi Jacob Mulin, known as Maharil, his student writes, and if she was a minor, he the rabbi would ask about her, how old she was, to see if she was eligible to receive the kiddushin. So in contrast to what I know from 12th and 13th century custom books, by the 14th century, we already have minors getting married. And look what the rabbi told his student to do. And they asked Mahari Segal, 
a young orphan who doesn't have a father or a brother, who should accept her kiddushin? And he said she should accept them herself. This is illegal. Someone under 12 who's a minor accepting her own kiddushin, she doesn't have the status of majority. But he's saying she should accept them herself. A few years later, Rabbi Israel Iserlein was asked a similar question. Whoever marries his minor daughter, what is the custom? Does he himself accept her kiddushin under the canopy? Or is it enough for him to stand near her and tell her to accept her kiddushin? And Iserlein brings a story. And he says like this. It seems to me that a person can give his minor daughter in marriage. Period. It's accepted. We do this now. And even though it's in the Talmud, we all know that Talmud, that a person should not betroth his minor daughter, etc. That is when he himself accepts the Kiddushin. But if he gives her permission to accept the Kiddushin and she accepts Amen. them, then it is allowed. And he quotes Rabbi Meir of Rothenberg, who we've already seen, saying, and this is what I did with my minor daughter. I told her, my daughter, accept your Kiddushin if you wish to. This is what he wrote, Rabbi Meir of Rothenberg. Now, this is fascinating. It also say it's a little bit annoying and upsetting because they're kind of twisting the system here by saying to her, do you want to be married, little girl? And then she says yes, and they say, great, you consented, you can get married. But that's not actually the point I want to make. The point I want to make is in the late 13th century, we see evidence of the importance of consent among Jews that's very similar to what's going on among Christians. Remember at the beginning of my talk, I told you that medieval Christians were very interested or they were really keen on making sure there was consent. And I hope you see the similarity between these two pictures from manuscripts, one of Christians and one of Jews, and how similar they are. Now, recently I found a beautiful article as I've been studying this, written by Kathleen Neuvenhuisen, I hope I'm saying her Dutch name correctly, who examines the art from the different decretals of marriage. And she shows very beautifully that although consent was accepted in Christian marriage throughout medieval Europe, it's expressed differently if you compare between places. So she examines 18 illustrations from France and from Italy, and she shows how differently consent looks in these two places. So in France, all the illuminations center on the couple alone, on the couple and their parents. Whereas in Italy, what you can see on the far side from me on the screen, there always is a community around them being part of this consent. Elizabeth Van Hoots, in her book, The Making of Medieval Marriage, that for me has been a model of how to work on medieval marriage, suggests that in elite families, it was the fathers or brothers of the bride who initiated the marriage process, approaching the girl's family. But she emphasizes that the farther away you go from wealthy families, the more choice the young couple had and the older their ages were. And Amy Livingston has suggest, suggested that we shouldn't underestimate the binding force of arranged unions as an engine for happiness and contentment. What I think Van Hoots and Livingston are telling us is that we should withhold our mo modern judgment on some of what is going on here and try to understand the system at work in medieval society. So my very short last part of my talk, what is going on? What happens if we look at non-legal sources? And remember that these sources are only representing a fraction of the marriages. And they're telling us more about what went wrong and what happened regularly. This is how I think it works socially. Parents were officially in charge of initiating first marriage choices and approving them. This could be done when children were young with an understanding that in many cases, it wouldn't work out. If it was the family, the more likely the bride would be a minor and that firm terms would be drawn up between the parents, usually for immediate financial purposes like we saw in that contract from England. And of course, the sources we've seen today together have been mainly those of rich families. However, despite the official role that parents played, children had significant ways to maneuver. So if we leave the legal literature and move to moral literature, this becomes immediately evident, and I'm going to end with two stories. Here is from a 13th century source, Sefer Hasidim. One Jew, one Jew commanded his two sons. The father said to one son, marry so-and-so, the daughter of so-and-so, because she comes from a good family. 
And he didn't do this. He married a different woman for her beauty and he had children who was indecent. So what is the moralist telling us? Listen to your father. You might end up with a bad match. But what is my point? The father told him who to marry and he said, no, I'm marrying someone else. And the other son married a woman without his father's permission. And the father came and would chase him away and embarrass him and say, after all, her family is such and such. And he would shame the relatives of his son's wife. And in the end, it happened that he became rich, that boy who didn't listen to his father. And the father and all his other sons needed that brother that they had shamed and wanted to marry into his family. And this is the stone which the builders rejected became the chief cornerstone. So this is a story about men. You'll say to me, Elisheva, what about women? So let's have a look at this story. One Jew sought after a woman, for he loved her and she loved him. He sent matchmakers to her father and to her mother, and they said, our daughter does not want this match. Now you all know that's not true. Right? She sent him a message secretly. I do want you. My father and mother are engaged in a different match. Just wait, because he will not take me, and afterward they will busy themselves with me for you. And then she gives him some advice. Just talk yourself primarily with how we can support ourselves. So if you want my parents to agree, you better have some prospects. So what we see here is, yes, parents were officially arranging marriages, but we can also see a lot of flexibility here behind the scenes of these young people. So the rules of the game are parents, just like people used to go ask for someone's father's hand in marriage until not so long ago. But in practice, these young people knew how to run that show. I'm not claiming they were completely independent. I'm not claiming they had consent or choice like we talk about it in modern terms today. But it is far more flexible than what we saw scholars suggesting in historiography and that what would come out of looking at the legal sources that seem to repeat the same language again and again over time. So let us return to Tevya with whom we began. When he was complaining about the disorder his daughters were creating with their marriage choices, as a new phenomenon, he was wrong. Such troubles had long been characteristic of the creation of matches, each period with its challenges and changes. The late 13th century seems to be a moment of shifting, both in light of Christian society where marriage had undergone significant change when it became a sacrament, and specifically for the Jews, where every day the exile became harsher. The legal literature that is at the heart of scholarship on these matters blurs such moments of change repeating the same phrases and languages again and again. We saw today how the language in the Mishnah was repeated and altered over time in the medieval sources, and how even the terms consent or cherem depended on the time and place in which they were used. What happened between the medieval period and the period of Tevya is important for understanding the involvement of the ways marriages were made. It was clear to us that the girls' ages became younger from what we saw in the 13th to 15th century. But what I want to emphasize in my ending is that in all the examples we saw today, there were many players, the young couple, the mothers, the fathers, the brothers, the relatives, other people in the community. And I think this is the strength of thinking of medieval marriage as a social institution rather than as a legal one. And that is something that I hope I will succeed in doing in my current project. So I'm ending here. And I would just say that, as you can see, this is a work in progress. And I want to thank Magda for telling me, Elisheva, there's a war going on, but you can get back to research. And to thank her for all the hours I've spent in the library over the past six weeks so that I could write this talk. So thank you, Magda. It was a true gift. I don't think you can even understand how great a gift it was for me. And I welcome any questions or comments you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, interesting stuff. So I, I was just wondering, because I'm, I'm not sure to circle back to it, uh, what you said about uh, what a woman with Abu Nah, uh, how, how did that, how, how do you understand that term that doesn't seem if the match is never found, it's not, that usually women whose like husband is off to war and never comes back and they don't know if the husband is alive. He's actually married, yeah. right? So that's a very good question. So I think if we read the source at face value, um, we would read it as really saying that this, these young girls were married, they were they went through Kiddushin and Nisuin, and we would take Kiddushin as like a shorthand for the whole marriage process. And then we would say, yes, you know, they would remain 
an aguna, and we don't want to make, if I read this at face value, we don't want to make the match. I'm trying to get back to the source. Um, we don't want to make that match. Here we are. We don't want to make that match because if we, let's say, agreed on the marriage terms, but then two years later, because of the harsh exile, things went wrong, this woman would be left with nobody and she would be committed to this person she was supposed to marry. I think that's a face value way of understanding it. I think what I'm trying to argue, but I didn't develop that argument quite enough for this talk tonight, is that throughout all the sources, and I kind of emphasize them and I didn't always talk about it, there are halakhic terms that are being used in the wrong way. And I can give you one example. There's a wonderful source that talks about this whole passage we've been talking about in my talk and says, why would someone want to marry a ktana? Why would someone want to marry a minor when he could marry a gdola, a woman of majority age? And then the source continues and says, a ktana is 13 years old and she's not ready to have babies yet. And a gdola is 16 and she can already have a baby. Now that's really interesting because we know medically today that that's really true, that a 16-year-old can have a baby much more safely than a 13-year-old, even if they're physically able to have a baby. But what's even more interesting is how did Ketana become 13? Ketana is supposed to be under 12. So what I'm trying to argue is that these medieval rabbis, they don't live their lives in Hebrew. They do live their lives in halacha, so I don't want to take away from their halachic knowledge, but they don't live their lives in Hebrew. And it could be in a commentary, like a Talmudic commentary, which isn't halacha, it's not a responsa, that the term is being used in inaccurately. So I think that's part of what I'm trying to get at. I don't think I can make that argument fully yet, but I think that's part of what I'm trying to suggest. So thank you for that question. Um, Anisha, are you... Do you think it could just be like a similar situation? Because the kind of tragedy of, of being in that state is, right, you want to get married, but you're unable to. Could it just be that you're kind of in the same situation if you're father is never able to secure a dowry? I think if you're rich enough to expect a dowry, that could be exactly what they mean. Um, and there are plenty of people who got married without dowries, of course, and we just forget about them as we read through history because we're so used to reading about the elites. Um, fathers who were from poorer families were expected not necessarily to secure a dowry, but to secure a profession for their daughters. Uh, so that's another way of looking at it. So that if we don't, if I can't give you a dowry, at least I can give you a profession. And there's a lovely story also in Tefer Hasidim about a daughter who complains that her father taught her a bad profession. And that's why she can't find a husband. She sews shrouds. Who wants to marry a woman who sews shrouds for the dead? And he says, my, she says, my sisters have much better professions, but I sew shrouds, so nobody wants me. So I think that would be going that direction. So um, your work obviously focuses on Ashkenaz in the broadest uh, sense of what Ashkenaz is. Um, my question is whether you know anything about marriage customs in the Sephardic communities and how, um, you know, providing dowry and, and things like that, whether in any of the sources that you are familiar with. So I'm going to answer in a different way. I'm going to say that a really nice example of Sephardic communities, it's far out I'm taking as Iberia right now, um, so a really nice example of Sephardic communities, for example, excommunication really worked there. So people there were excommunicated. And what my student, Dr. Miri Fenton, showed is that in Spain, people were excommunicated, whereas in Ashkenaz, it was just a threat and they were usually fined. So going back to that, I would say that we have more sources from medieval Spain that tell us about minors being married than we do from Ashkenaz throughout the period. And I think that part of what I had to do to write this talk or to do this research was to go through all the sources that all the different people mention, and I brought Agus and Grossman, but I could bring all kinds of other examples as well and say, okay, what is Ashkenazic in my sources? So my work has actually been the opposite, which has been to say, what are the Ashkenazic sources and what do they tell me? And let's not mishmash the Ashkenazic with the Sephardic sources and say everything's the same all over Europe, because there's nothing more local than marriage customs, nothing more local than life cycle rituals and the way it's done, even when there are things that are the same across time and also across place. The other part of the answer would be that I think somebody has to write a social history of medieval Spain. And I think that hasn't quite yet been written in the way that we've been working on Ashkenaz over the past decades. And I think I'm part of like a, a gang of scholars that works on these questions, these social questions of medieval Ashkenaz. And there are many fewer of us uh, in medieval Spain uh, for a whole variety of reasons, but I think that's something that still needs to be done. 
Um, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Um, I wanted to ask you um, how you found the sources that you found. Um, and um, specifically what I'm thinking about is um, in response, I wonder if responsa uh, regarding respecting your parents, kibud avaim, that that could open up sort of additional sources where the question is not, can you marry a minor was consent, but rather children who are asking, do I have to marry the person my parents want me to? Um, is that part of respecting and fearing your parents, or is that sort of beyond the bounds? So I'm, I'm curious sort of how you collect your sources and like unexpected places to find others. So I would say that your question takes me back to my first book, uh, Mothers and Children, which is about parents and children. And then I really looked at um, respecting your parents as one of the commandments, of course, one of the 10 commandments, and then going from there and trying to understand things. And I think very interestingly, and this is true also in the Talmud, by the way, uh, you hear about respecting your parents when you're a child, and you hear about respecting your parents when your parents are old. Those are two separate stages of life. There's very little on that middle section. And actually, if you look at, for example, late antique, antique literature, there's much more on what a parent owes his or her child, let's say from age six to 40. If I have to kind of generalize, six sounding very, very young to us today, but that is the age that is given in some of the rabbinic sources. And like say 40, because by then your parent will be old. So for 60 is very old in the medieval period if you have a parent who's 60. And it doesn't sound like that's what you have to listen to your parent about. In other words, that's not where we find it. We also don't find it in um, moral wills that give children ins instructions on what they're supposed to do. They don't say you have to marry who your, your parent tells you to marry. Uh, and that really is a very interesting aspect of parent-children's dynamic. I think part of what I hope to gain by this research is kind of coming around to that question from the other side. So that's answer part one. Answer part two is to say that uh, you only, what I presented tonight is really one part of the way I work. So the way I work in my research, and I actually have a really nice slide to show you. So you let me get to my slide and I can show it to you. Mm -hmm. I hope I'm going in the right direction. I'm going the wrong direction. So we'll get there really fast. Um, but one of the things that I've done over the past years is I've had research groups. So um, when Professor Paul introduced me, he mentioned the group Beyond the Elite, which was my first research group. And currently I'm, I'm leading this Contending with Crisis research group. And the Contending with Crisis, and both research groups uh, consist of a number of students. So there, right now I have 10 students. And we sit together in a joint phase at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Uh, for any of you who are interested in coming to Israel and interested in medieval things, I accept graduate students from other institutions who come for a year, preferably with some of their own money. If they don't have some of their own money, I give them some money if I have enough money. And they sit with us um, for that period. And the idea behind the research group is that we all are doing our own work. So I'm working on medieval marriage and other people are working on their own projects, but we all are asking similar questions. And we all are expert, experts on different types of sources. But by working together, and what you have here is my favorite slide with all the different types of sources we try to work on, but by working together, we can learn from each other and we can learn about other people's sources. So for example, one of my favorite sources for finding out about marriage is tombstones. From tombstones, you can hear a lot about what the person burying his or her spouse had to say about the person they're burying. And you learn something about the ideals, about the values. Now, of course, nobody writes on their husband's tombstone. He was a bastard. I couldn't stand him. Thank God he's dead, right? So nobody writes anything of that sort. So you only hear the really good characteristics of whoever you're burying, but you do hear things that are very, very interesting. Another thing I've become very interested about in over the past years and in my last book, and that's why I did a detour, because I was writing this book about marriage when I wrote the Biblical Women book. So it was songs that were sung. So I'm really interested in what songs were sung at different rituals like weddings and finding out what kind of values they express as well. And I discovered that all the love songs or the most popular love songs that were sung at weddings had to do with God blessing you like uh, Adam and Eve, like Abraham and Sarah, like Isaac and Rebecca, et cetera, et cetera. And to each couple, they ascribed a quality. And I got really interested in what those qualities were. So that's another way I try to find out about these different things. And I guess the basic rule that every medievalist knows is when you open a manuscript, 
You go through the entire manuscript. You don't skip pages. You try to see what's hiding there. Even if somebody has itemized it for you, that's where I find the best things. Uh, so for example, looking for minors getting married, rituals of weddings, I'm finding it only in one. Do you know how many I had to look at? <laughs> I only found it in one. But that one find was like amazing, right? So that's kind of how I try to go about my work with like these Excel sheets that sometimes work and sometimes don't. And I always wish I had a better system. Uh, and another way I really looked at it lately, I'm learning about couples, is looking at donations given by couples and the way those couples were described. So those are just some examples of how I'm trying to look at married life. You heard about making marriages tonight, but I hope today, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit jet lagged still, sorry. Uh, you heard about making marriages today, but of course I'll be working on other aspects of marriage as I go along. If there are a couple of questions from our audience online. Um, one is uh, when did the uh, matchmakers emerge as a as intermediate? I mean, we have the shluchim what you mentioned, but and also um, whether you have come across or, or you can even estimate uh, how many young women rejected the proposals that were made under it. Okay, so uh, the first question, I don't know exactly when matchmakers come about because it depends what you call a matchmaker. I think there were always matchmakers who said, hey, do you want to meet her? Or you should meet his family. So to say that the, when did matchmakers come about, that I think is a eternal question. When were paid matchmakers? When were matchmakers paid? If we go back to Fiddler on the Roof, when did they have a yenta who was making the matches and getting money for that? Scholars have noted that that's a 12th and early 13th century phenomena and that rabbis often took on the job of matchmaking. And this raises lots of interesting questions. To what extent did people listen to the rabbis? Who went to the rabbis for matchmaking? Did you have to go to the rabbis for matchmaking? By the 14th and 15th century, you probably had passed through the rabbi. Because these communities are super small. We're talking about really small communities that are impoverished after a lot of trauma, or if they're very rich, maybe they don't go to the rabbi, they just do what they want to do. So I don't have a very good answer. I would go by the scholarly research to date, which is late 13th, early 14th century. We have rabbis as matchmakers. But I hope, that like I showed you, that when you reread the legal sources, you come up with new results. Maybe I'll come up with new results when I look for that too. How many people rejected these matches? Well, of course, if they rejected it and everything went okay, we don't know about it. So we only know about the cases when it went wrong. So when did it go wrong? It went wrong in two cases or in two situations that I can kind of pinpoint and put my finger on. One is when a lot of money is involved. And then, of course, if Bella Say gave Benjamin a book that was worth a ton of money and she gave him 20 sterling to go and give loans with and to use as credit for credit um, purposes, and he went and used that money and then something happened to that money and he has to pay her back. That's when it goes wrong. And that's when we hear about it because somebody's out there to lure, lose a lot of money. So he or she will do whatever they can. Please note the he or she, it's not just fathers. We have this mother here doing it, right? Right, there was this agreement between the father of the groom and, and the, the mother of the, of the bride. That's really interesting. And there's even another source I couldn't bring in tonight in which they get married, they don't get along, they part and the father says, you know, they parted so fast, give me back my money. And then the woman says, I'm much better at making money than he is, just stay with me. So it's really interesting to see that dynamic going on in the sources. So that's one case when it goes wrong. The other case when it goes wrong is another response that I've talked about at length in a different talk. So although you didn't hear that talk, I didn't want to talk about it again. Um, and it's a beautiful case in which two fathers agree their children will marry and they send an agent. I didn't talk at all about agents today. And the agent comes to the village where the girl lives with a ring and a belt and lots of gifts. And he walks into the house. He wants to give the gift to the girl. He puts her head down and she refuses to accept it. And she refuses that gift. But afterwards, a rumor goes out that she's actually married. <clears throat> the rumor goes out that she's actually married and nobody will marry her. And that's really interesting because he never gave her a ring. He never said any of the words you're supposed to say. There was no I do. There was no consent. There was nothing. But that was enough for people to say she was promised. So I think there were certain rituals that made this problematic. And then we hear about it. 
Good. Two more questions. We'll go for, yeah. Thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed this. Um, I loved the stories. I love the stories here on this word cloud situation. And I was just wondering maybe about different kinds of stories, you know, in the Christian context, so much of the talk about consent and about, um, you know, um, ways that people make marriages and break marriages is often with very imaginative literature, very fanciful literature, um, as well as, you know, sort of poetry. And I, I love that you mentioned songs already, but I was just wondering if some of these issues of consent um, and the ways that people are conceiving of consentability, et cetera, is that coming up in any, are there sources that you use that are more imaginative um, from this period um, besides the songs? The song sounds amazing. Somebody might suspect that I planted you in the audience. <laughs> and that's the chapter that I finished in this book so that you haven't heard it tonight because I was trying tonight today because I was trying to uh, talk about something new so that I would get myself moving to do something new. Um, but there is a collection of tales from the late 13th century France um, that we call Sefer Maasim. Sefer Maasim is called that because Maasim means tale. And there are 60 some odd tales in that collection. It's from, uh, it's in an Oxford manuscript. And each one starts with the word masse. So we call it Zephyr Maasim. Um, and my colleague, Professor Rella Kuchilevsky from Barilan University, uh, she was working on that and I worked on it with her as a historian. So there are two really lovely stories in there. And one of them is completely fanciful and completely medieval. And I actually teach it often in my classes in comparison to Marie de France and some of her lays. And you can actually see how very similar things are going on there. So there is a lot of fancifulness, but there's also a lot of really interesting social things you can learn. Um, and I'll just very briefly say that to me, these stories are kind of the limits of imagination, right? So I got stuck coming here today because my phone stopped working and I couldn't get in touch with anybody. That's the truth. And if I told you that story, you would all believe me, right? Because we all have phones and we all have trouble with our phones once in a while and we all get stuck sometimes. But if I told you I got stuck today because the demon got on the subway and wouldn't let me get off the subway, None of you would believe me. And you might tell Professor Tedder that Elisheva came from Israel, but she's not quite what she used to be before she came from Israel, right? <laughs> now, if we were in the medieval period, and I told you I couldn't come to a meeting because my phone stopped working, you would think I was nuts because nobody would know what a phone was, etc. But if I told you a demon stopped me on the way to work today, you might believe me. Because right? that's the kind of stories medieval people tell. So what I'm trying to say is that when we read these medieval stories about consent, that's what I look for in them. In other words, what are the limits of the imagination? And what are they telling me that's so clear to them that they're just telling it, you know, like it is? And to us, it raises questions. So that's what I like those stories for. And in them, the young people fall in love. They make pledges to each other. And then they go to great lengths to uh, either live up to those pledges or to make sure those pledges work out even when it's against all odds, if their parents are opposed to the marriage, if they can't make them enough money, if they're not rich enough, et cetera, et cetera. So if you go look into her, um, theme, there are two stories like that. One is called The Sister and the Weasel. And the other one is called The Poor Young Bachelor. And you'll be able to find those stories there. I I'm just want to echo everybody what a great talk this was. And what I really liked about it was how you said you focus on a local practice, but you always kept it in the larger context. And so I'm wondering for that third legal source you were talking about, the Tosifus that everybody misinterprets chronologically, does it mark kind of a blip on the radar or does it start new traditions and new trends that are long-term? So I think what I was trying to show in the third section of the talk is that we do have evidence that at least the rabbis are doing this afterwards pretty consistently. I also want to be really clear. I'm pretty sure that there were minor girls who were married throughout the medieval period. I just don't think there were as many of them as scholars have suggested. And very, very interestingly, my colleague, Professor Eve Krakowski, who's written about marriage in medieval Egypt, she's made the same argument. In other words, she's made that same argument against scholars who've tried to argue that girls are getting married off as minors so often as I'm trying to make about Ashkenaz, um, and we're both reacting to this same kind of literature that's made these generalizations. But of course, we also both have not enough evidence because there are not enough uh, documents that tell us the story of what went on as usual in medieval life. So coming back and trying to maybe pull all this together, because this is the end, I would say that 
one of the strengths I see in working on so many different sources is that if we have something that appears in a legal source, and then it appears in moral literature, and then it appears in the stories, and then I find evidence of it in the tombstone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then I can say, I have enough echoes of this that even if I only have a few sources, it's echoing enough, but it must be something that's happening on the ground because otherwise, of course, we're left counting our sources. And if you only have three sources that show something, it's enough for somebody to come and find five sources that show the opposite and you already don't have an argument. So we all try as historians not to make too many arguments based on you know, very few sources. Um, so I think that that's part of what I'm trying to do here. And I think that by looking at the different people involved in the ritual, we're able to hear more voices from the past and to realize that marriage, and here maybe I'll come back to modernity, and I'll say also marriage today takes on many forms. There are many different forms of marriage, and I will say there are many contested forms of marriage, right? And that's something that we deal with in the modern world. Just like the question of consent is something we grapple with in the modern world. So I think that these are not foreign questions to us, but taking them back to the past, we have to try to understand what that means. So for example, something that wouldn't be considered a marriage in the Middle Ages would be a Christian and a Jew who had an ongoing long-term relationship that included a sexual relationship, but maybe also included children and a joint economy, et cetera, et cetera, because that wouldn't be considered a marriage because religiously a Jew couldn't marry a Christian. So that would be what my colleague, Professor Ruth Mather Karras is called an unmarriage, right? Uh, an unmarriage because it's a union that exists, but it's an unmarriage. So I think part of what I'm trying to figure out is the contours of that and to figure out what fits and what doesn't fit, what echoes and what doesn't echo. And yes, minors were married. Some men married their nine-year-old and some families decided that their 10-year-old orphan cousin should be married. But this was definitely not the norm and to generalize it and make it the norm of medieval Jews in Europe would be a mistake. What I think is really interesting, and I'll leave this to the early modernists, um, is what happened between, let's say, the 13th, 14th century and the 19th century, when at least what Shalom Aleichem is describing is what is considered the norm, even if that norm also had many, many exceptions. <laughs>